everyone and welcome to the Loxatchee River District's River Center. Uh, thank you for joining us on our next virtual field trip and today we are going to be learning about how our community actually takes our wastewater and turns it into a reusable resource. Now to understand our community today we need to take a glimpse into the past. The Loxahatchee River is an integral part of our community. It is shaped by the river. Our strong boating and fishing culture is based on the beauty and bounty found in its waters. In turn, the river is shaped by our actions. Dams, dredging, and development have impacted this fragile ecosystem. Today, the river is healthy and vibrant because concerned citizens have worked hard to safeguard habitats and wildlife in the watershed. So what will our river look like in 2030? We can decide, be a part of this living history and contribute to our exceptional legacy. Join us in preserving and protecting the Loxahatchee River for future generations. There is evidence of Native Americans living along the Loxahatchee from the headwaters to the inlet for more than 5,000 years. The Jupiter Inlet Lighthouse was lit for the first time in 1860 to help with navigation along the Atlantic coast, the inlet, and the Indian River Lagoon. The late 1800s bought development and industry with paddle wheel steamboats, sailing vessels, and railroads bringing passengers, supplies, and mail. The early 1900s was a boom with the first bridge built across the Loxahatchee River, dams along the Northwest Fork were created, and the inlet was dredged and permanently opened. For the next 60 years, as population increased, so did the negative changes to the river through drainage projects and canals, as well as an increase in pollution due to agriculture, habitat loss, and residential runoff. In 1971, the state legislator created the Loxahatchee River Environmental Control District. They were charged with the mission to preserve and protect the Loxahatchee River. The first step was creating a new regional wastewater treatment facility. In 1977, it began operations with 1,000 customers. Today, the wastewater facility can treat up to 11 million gallons a day and now serves more than 75,000 people in northern Palm Beach County and southern Martin County. They're dedicated to protecting public health and preserving the Loxahatchee River watershed and its natural habitats through innovative wastewater solutions, research, and environmental stewardship. So let's go over the process of turning our wastewater into irrigation quality reclaimed water. So the water that is being flushed down our toilets, um, emptied from our bathtubs, washing our clothes and washing our dishes, all of that water goes into our sewer systems and that water reaches the Loxahatchee River District. So the first part that it enters is our headworks. And this is where the wastewater treatment begins because anything that gets thrown down your toilet or gets flushed away, that's garbage has to come out before the process continues. So there are large screens to remove all of that large debris. Have you ever used your toilet like a garbage can? Have you ever flushed paper towels, baby wipes, or wrappers down your toilet? Well, this is where they end up. So welcome to Headworks. This is where all of our solid waste actually gets removed from our wastewater. So all that stuff that gets flushed down your toilets ends up here first, okay? And we filter out using our bar screens, which I just showed you, we filter out all that large debris and we empty it out into a dumpster that goes to the Solid Waste Authority. After it goes through Headworks, it then enters into our equalization tanks. There are two large equalization tanks on property and Basically, it's designed to hold the water. Um, as the water flows through the whole system, it has to flow through at a constant normal rate. But 
wastewater doesn't always come in at a constant rate. Most of our wastewater comes in in the morning when everyone's getting ready for work and for school between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. And then again, when we all come home from work and school between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. So the water sits here until it's ready to go through the process at an equal rate. These are equalization tanks. They actually help control the flow of water as it comes into the plant. So after it's gone through our headworks, it'll then go into our EQ tanks. And each tank can actually hold up to 750,000 gallons of water. So on to step three, and this is our most important part of the whole process. This is our aeration basin, and it's when wastewater is mixed with oxygen, and inside this basin is where helpful bacteria and other microorganisms are designed to decompose or eat organic matter. So they're eating the organic material, the waste that's flushed down your toilet they're doing the hard work for us. Welcome to the aeration basin, also known as the air bay. This is where our biological process starts. Inside the air bay are an estimated 10 quadrillion microbes ready to break down the waste that comes in with our water. These microbes consume ammonia, but where does that ammonia come from? Well, it comes from human waste, food, and other biologicals that are in decay. As the microbes consume the ammonia, they fix the nitrogen into other forms. First, they fix into nitrite, which is NO2, and then nitrate, which is NO3. That's actually the goal, to fix the nitrogen from the toxic ammonia to non-toxic nitrites and nitrates that can be released back into our environment for further processing. Our microbes are aerobic, meaning that they actually need oxygen to survive, just like we do. To keep up with the amount of ammonia and microbes that we have in the air bay, we pump air into the air bays constantly. To make these microbes work faster, we turn the air up. To slow them down, we turn the air down, reducing the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water. Similar to humans, if you reduce the amount of available oxygen, like climbing a tall mountain, we will slow down. Why is it so important to remove nitrogen from wastewater? Well, in certain forms, nitrogen can, number one, deplete dissolved oxygen in waters, which is toxic to aquatic life. Number two, present a public health hazard. And number three, affect the suitability of wastewater for reuse purposes. If wastewater leaving the facility contains high nutrients, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, it can cause eutrophication or the excessive growth of plant and algae creating blooms in lakes, streams, and rivers. Why is it important to monitor the nitrogen parameters? Remember, these bacteria are aerobes. They must have free dissolved oxygen to perform their work and are only active when conditions are just right. It is the job of the wastewater plant operator to continually monitor the influent and effluent, the water coming in and out of the air bay, and the rest of the facility. They are the ones ensuring the best conditions are being met for the nitrogen-eating bacteria and making sure these important organisms are doing their job properly. Step four are our clarifiers. And in here, the water is slowed down even more. And what this does is this allows those microorganisms, the microbes, and any other solid waste that didn't get eaten before, and it allows them to get to clump together and actually settle down at the bottom of the clarifier. All of that sludge um, is either sent to a dewatering plant and used for fertilizer, created into fertilizer, and a small amount of it, the activated sludge fill of microbes, is sent back to the aeration basin to continue the process. Welcome to our clarifier. This is where we actually slow down our water. And we have these two giant arms that stick out, also called weirs, that help sort any sort of material that floats to the top and helps get rid of material that is floated to the bottom, also called sludge.
So we are at now step five, which is advanced filtration. So we've gone from the aeration basin through the clarifiers, and now we're trying to get even the smallest of microbes or maybe even hidden pathogens out of the water at this process. So behind me are deep bed filters. This is the final filtering step, and it actually removes a lot of fine particles or anything that got left behind through the rest of our process. Step six is the chlorine contact. Now, this is the location where small amounts of chlorine is added to ensure disinfection to make sure that there are no pathogens or bacteria entering into um, the water that's going to be used, again, in our community. And this is the last part of the process. This is also where this water is required to meet EPA standards before it enters into our community. Welcome to the chlorine contact chamber. So this is where our water has to come in contact with chlorine from anywhere to 20 to 30 minutes in order for it to be effective. And it moves kind of like a lazy river along these corridors and then eventually will make its way out into our retention ponds. So here at this site, we're actually going to be taking some water samples, one from our chlorine contact chamber and then one from our retention pond. And we're actually going to see if there's a difference between the water quality. We're going to check for ammonia, nitrates, and nitrites. We're also going to look at the pH and the turbidity. So once the water leaves the chlorine contact and it flows through that area for its final disinfectant, it's then added into our retention storage ponds, which is on property. And these large ponds act as human-made habitats with an abundance of life found in there. At this time, the water is easily able to be reconnected with the water cycle. It can be evaporated up into our atmosphere and then continue on its water journey. Water can also, in our lakes in the back of the property, water can go into and seep into the ground, percolate down, and eventually end back up into our aquifers, which is our drinking water eventually. Most of the water that are in these ponds um, are sent to 11 different golf courses and Abacoa, where this water is now used to irrigate our lawns, the golf courses, and baseball fields. How amazing that we can take recycled wastewater instead of the drinking water found in our aquifers and use it to keep our grass green. So this is an amazing way that we can help in the water conservation efforts for our water resources. So behind me is our retention ponds, and right over there are some of our retention lakes. And you'll notice that there's tons of wildlife that hangs out here. So normally you can find alligators, wood storks, roseate spoonbills, osprey, Egyptian geese, great blue herons, anhingas, sandhill cranes, and even wood ducks. We're going to actually take a sample of our water from our retention ponds using our giant sample pole and we're going to compare it to the sample that we pulled at the chlorine contact chamber. So now that we've gotten our two samples, one from the chlorine contact chamber and one from our retention pond, now we're going to do some really basic water quality tests. We're going to check ammonia, nitrite, nitrates, and pH. So between our two samples that we pulled, do you think there's going to be a difference between the two? What are your predictions?
So now that we've done all of our tests, we're going to look at our results. So first one is our ammonia. And this darker one is from our chlorine contact chamber. And the lighter one is from our attention pond. So this shows that we did have a reduction in our ammonia, which is the whole point of our process is to diminish the amount of ammonia that is in our water. So successful. <laughs> Now, the next one was our nitrites, and we really didn't see a huge difference between both our chlorine contact chamber and our retention ponds, which is okay. That usually happens. So the next one we're going to look at is our nitrate, and we did notice a slight elevation in nitrates between um, in our retention ponds as opposed to our chlorine contact chamber. Our chlorine contact chamber was a little bit lighter, which means that there's not as much. <laughs> So again, that's kind of what we want to see. We want to see those higher nitrate numbers. That means that our process is working. Now we're going to look at our pH samples. So the process of nitrification produces acid. This acid forms a lower pH of the water and can cause a reduction of the growth rate of nitrifying bacteria. So it's important to know our pH levels to make sure that our bacteria is happy and it's working. The last and final test that we are going to perform is going to measure turbidity. So turbidity measures the clarity of water. We are looking for the amount of suspended solids or suspended particles. And when we think of murky water, um, we're thinking of a, a difference or a higher amount of turbidity. So the more suspended solids that are in the water, the higher turbidity. And a very common way to measure this is by using a secu disc. So the goal is, is when you are putting the secu disc down into the water, you are looking to see not necessarily uh, a difference where you can't see the disc at all, but only where you can't uh, determine the black from the white. And so you will, each little mark is measured off by a meter and you continue to drop it into the water until you can't distinguish between the black and the white, and that will give you an approximate uh, measure for turbidity. Now, what we're going to use is uh, a special tool, and we are calling this the turbidity tube, and what you'll notice is down this tube is another tiny, tiny secu disc. This helps us measure turbidity in shallow areas and for our sake, uh, the water that we collected. So we're gonna kind of just show you what the turbidity might be of both of these samples. And you'll also notice that it's a little bit more accurate as far as its measurements, um, where you actually have centimeters. We are going to measure our water that was taken from the chlorine contact. Now remember, this is the water that has just gone through that process uh, to remove the wastewater, but it is before it actually enters into the retention pond. So we are going to fill this all the way up. I'm gonna let you guys take a look and see if you can notice a change in the secu disc. All right, so you'll notice that you can still definitely see the difference between the black and the white. And usually when we notice this, we uh, just determine that it is clear at bottom. Now we are going to take a look at the water that we collected at the retention pond. So we're gonna build this up. Gonna hold it as steady as I can, and we're gonna see. All right, so we notice that there is no definitive difference between the black and white. So we do see a higher turbidity 
in the retention ponds. So why would you imagine the turbidity to be higher in the ponds? What would be some variables you would imagine? If we remember back to our trip to the chlorine contact, we remember that that water only spends 20 to 30 minutes and it's specifically to be disinfected. So hopefully that water has uh, less suspended solids at that point in time because it's the very end um, of the wastewater treatment process. The retention pond is open to the elements and uh, the water that's in here can stay seven days as it go, flows from the ponds to the lakes before it's pumped out into uh, our golf courses. And remember, that water is a habitat for a lot of different animals. It has plant life in there. Um, it's a larger surface area. And so we are gonna find uh, a lot of different materials and sediment found in our retention ponds. So those are some of the things, some of the variables that we can imagine why we would find a difference in the clarity. Why are our efforts important on a global level? The United Nations created the Sustainable Development Goals. These goals are a call for action by all countries, rich, poor, and middle income, to promote prosperity while protecting the planet. These 17 goals to transform our world and goal six is to ensure access to water and sanitation for all. So three in 10 people lack access to safely managed drinking water services. 2.4 billion people lack access to basic sanitation services such as toilets or latrines. More than 80% of wastewater resulting from human activities is discharged into rivers or the sea without any pollution removal. Each day, nearly 1,000 children die due to preventable water and sanitation related diseases. And approximately 70% of all water abstracted from rivers, lakes, and aquifers is used for irrigation. On a global scale, it can feel like an impossible task to accomplish, but we are making local efforts to ensure access to clean water and sanitation for all. That's why we do it. The vision of the Loxatu River District is to inspire and achieve a healthy environment. And this includes the health of its residents and visitors, as well as the abundant life in the natural environment and the Loxahatchee River watershed. LRD has received the EPA's National Award for Outstanding Wastewater Treatment Facility, as well as Best in the Nation for Innovative and Safe Regional Wastewater Treatment. We are working together, not only for our health today, but for future generations to come. They too will get to enjoy and live around the pristine waters and hopefully become stewards in their time. All to protect and preserve the Loxahatchee River. Just a reminder, please don't use your toilet as a garbage can. Make sure you don't put grease, medication, and corrosive chemicals down the drain. Be conscious about the amount of water that you're using to water your lawns and to wash your vehicles. Your efforts to be wise with water are appreciated by all. Here is our call to action. Get involved. Being an active participant in your local government and speak out as a steward for our water resources. Volunteer. 
Our time, efforts, and dedication will make a difference. We can all be stewards of the river. So thank you guys for joining us today um, and to get in touch with us with any questions um, or to schedule a live virtual field trip with us, please email education at lrecd.org. Thanks guys.